I want to turn your attention to John chapter 10 this morning. And I want to ask you, what are your needs? What are your needs? You may have thought at this time of year, I need my football team to win. I need a new roof on my home, or I need a job, or I need this physical malady to be removed. All of those things are circumstances, and our good God knows what we need even before we ask. But when we think about external circumstances or the situations we're in, we might ask other questions. What do I need in order to be pleasing to God? What do, I, what do I need in order to be blessed of the Lord? To be fulfilled, what do I need to have eternal life? What do I need to be in a right relationship with my maker? And we can do all of those things with a losing football team, a leaky roof, no job, and poor health. Really, what needs do you have? Do you need your sins forgiven this morning? Do you need the assurance of eternal life and a relationship to God? Do you need to be encouraged? Do you need spiritual strength and endurance? Do you need to be fortified in the truth this morning? Do you need correction? Do you need a course correction? Are there sins in your heart that are held on to tightly and must be let go of, turned from, put to death? I make so bold a statement this morning as to suggest that the answer to every need, every need that you have here this morning, is found in the text we will look at together. Read with me, if you will, from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 11 through 15. Here Jesus is speaking, and he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand, not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming. And leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and he is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And I know my own and my own know me. Even as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Very succinctly this morning, we're going to be looking at five features of our good shepherd's care. What is Jesus like? What is his care for his sheep like? First of all, we will see that Jesus' care for his sheep is matchless. It is matchless. Look down at verse 11. I am the good shepherd, Jesus says. This is one of Jesus' exclusive truth claims about himself. He is claiming to be unique, unparalleled, peerless, superlative, incomparable. He is matchless. He is matchless in who he is. He is matchless in what he does. He is matchless as a shepherd. It is why he can say to the so-called shepherds over Israel, I am the good shepherd. He can say this, first of all, because he is God. Jesus is doing no less than asserting his deity in this verse. He begins by saying, I am. That should stand out to us who are familiar with the Bible. There are a number of I am statements in the Gospel of John, and I believe each one of these is an echo of Exodus 3.14. There it was that God said to Moses when Moses asked, Who shall I say is sending me to Pharaoh to get the people out of Egypt? And God's response to Moses in Exodus 3.14 is, I am that I am, or I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And if we are to take the I am statement in Exodus 3.14, the same way that it reads in Exodus 3.12, where the same verb is translated, I will be with you, and then that I am statement in Exodus 3.14 can be read something like, I will be that I will be. In other words, there's an anticipation of the God of the universe being with his people 
And here, Jesus in John 10 makes an unequivocal statement that the I am is here. Like the other I am statements in the Gospel of John, Jesus is saying the I am himself very intentionally to indicate that the God who promised that he would be with his people has come. The I am is here. He's rescuing his people from empty religion. He's bringing them to himself. Jesus is I am in the flesh. And in the anticipation of God being in the midst of his people, in the midst of the congregation, all of that expectation is met in this one who tabernacled among us. And Jesus appends to this I am statement the description, the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And most of the I am statements come with a predicate. They come with a I am something. I am the door. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Here I am the good shepherd. You know that in John 8, 58, Jesus leaves out any predication. He simply says, before Abraham was, I am. These statements are emphatic in the gospel of John. And here it is tied to Jesus being the good shepherd. Again, this is an exclusive claim to be the one, the only, the superlative shepherd, the peerless one, the matchless good shepherd, the very shepherd that God is described as in Psalm 23. Yahweh is my shepherd. Behold, I shall not want. The very shepherd described in Ezekiel 34, the promised one who would come and displace the bad shepherds, and be the good shepherd of God's people Israel. Genesis 49, 24 describes God this way. He is the mighty one of Jacob, that is the mighty one of Israel. And he is the shepherd and the stone of Israel. Psalm 80, verse 1 describes God this way. Give ear, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth. This is God, the shepherd, and he is here in the flesh. For Jesus to say, I am the good shepherd, is to say I'm the fulfillment of Ezekiel 34, 10, and 11. I am the fulfillment of Psalm 23. I am tabernacling among you as the shepherd of Israel tabernacled amongst the people in the wilderness. And this is stated uh, this way in the original. Uh, the sh- I am the shepherd The good one, Jesus says. In English, this just simply reads, I am the good shepherd. We can use adjectives describing nouns in in various ways. You can describe a fast car. And in English, we can emphasize that. You can put it in all caps and say, that is a fast car. Or you can say, that's a fast car. Meaning it's something fast that's different than other things that are fast. But here, the way this is worded is something like this, an emphasis on both. Uh, That is a car, a fast one. Here, Jesus is the shepherd, and he is really good. And the climax of this description ends up on the word good. And good here is not the word normally used for moral excellence, but the word used for that which is beautiful and pleasing. That which is choice or excellent, it's used of the wine in John 2.10. It was the good wine that was served last. The goodness of Christ here, his beauty, his excellence, particularly expressed in the sympathy that he has in being a shepherd of his sheep, is worded really well by Octavius Winslow in his classic work, The Sympathy of Christ. And I just want to read these words to you. Your Savior, Winslow writes, was sensitive to soul sorrow. And think you that he will chide or be indifferent to yours? Oh, no. He knows your spirit's grief and he will comfort it. He has passed through your mental sorrow and he will soothe it. He has felt your soul darkness and he will cheer it. You are perhaps suffering from a present or are shrinking from an anticipated sorrow. The cup is in your trembling hand. You pray, oh, Father, if it's possible, if it be possible, let it pass from me. Sustain me in this calamity beneath which my wounded spirit sinks. Spare me the impending blow from which my sensitive spirit recoils. 
Oh, think you that the sympathy of Christ is not with you now? Can he not enter with you into that cloud, share with you that cup, understand that recoil of feeling, and make all allowance for these keen, wounded, crushed sensibilities? The one who himself prayed, Father, if it be possible. Who will forbid you praying to him? Not Jesus. He is a shepherd and a good shepherd. For Jesus to say, I am the good shepherd, is a contrast to all the bad shepherds, to the Pharisees, whom he is speaking to right here in John 10. You remember that John 10 is Jesus' commentary on what happened in John 9. And in John 9, Jesus released one of his own poor sheep, oppressed by the faux religious leaders, under their thumb as they built their own empires, uncared for, left aside, and excommunicated, Jesus went in and got him out, rescuing his own sheep. And John chapter 10, as he talks to the religious leaders, is explaining what he just did. He says, I am the good shepherd. That's a contrast to your shepherding, religious leaders, says Jesus. And for Jesus to say he is the good shepherd means this is a contrast to all shepherds. There may be some good shepherds out there, literally speaking, uh, good guys who tend sheep, and, and metaphorically speaking, under shepherds who faithfully pastor and care for God's people. But Jesus is singularly the good shepherd. He is matchless and superlative. Of course, this shepherd metaphor captures something significant about Jesus' care for his people. But the metaphor itself is too small to capture Jesus. We talked last week about why the Bible uses so many different metaphors to describe God and his work with his people. Because no single picture can capture it all. Charles Spurgeon preached this. There is more in Jesus, he said, more in Jesus, the good shepherd, than you can pack away in a shepherd. He is the good, the great, the chief shepherd, but he is much more. Emblems to set him forth may be multiplied as the drops of the morning, but the whole multitude will fail to reflect all his brightness. Creation is too small a frame in which to hang his likeness. Human thought is too contracted, human speech too feeble to set him forth to the full. He is inconceivably above our conceptions, unutterably above our utterances. He is a good shepherd. He is the good shepherd. A second feature of Christ's care for his people is its sacrificial nature. Jesus' care for his sheep is sacrificial. Look again at verse 11 in the second half. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is again a contrast to the Pharisees to whom he is speaking. They would not lift a finger to help those in need, but the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is an indictment of hypocritical religion, and it's damning. So-called religious gurus and religious leaders tell people what to do and expect them to live up to the expectations that they themselves cannot and will not live out. They lend no aid. They have no path to God. They are frauds. As shepherds of God's people, the religious leaders of Jesus' day were not good. They were hypocrites, self-interested power brokers who used the needs of people and the words of God to further their own ambitions. But the good shepherd, verse 11, lays down his life for the sheep. And Jesus is speaking about himself. He just said, I am the good shepherd. Here's what the good shepherd does. He says this in the third person here in verse 11. He'll say it in the first person in verse 15. And it's not just about making sacrifices for others. Jesus is not simply saying he was willing to be sacrificed in the place of others. And here's where the metaphor to a Middle Eastern shepherd breaks down. Good Middle Eastern shepherds didn't go to work hoping to die. They did not set out each day trying to take the place of the inevitable demise of their sheep. Shepherds wanted to go home to their families. In fact, Jewish law allowed, and this is not biblical law, this is extra-biblical Jewish expectations, but enforceable ones, said this, if one wolf shows up and threatens the flock, the shepherd needs to stand in and defend the flock. But if a pack of wolves shows up, run. <laughs> These things just happen. 
A good Middle Eastern shepherd was supposed to put himself in harm's way to protect the sheep. But in doing so, his goal was to win, to survive, to to live to shepherd another day. And if a shepherd lost a fight with a bear, the sheep would be not safe. They would be vulnerable because the shepherd himself was lost. If the shepherd became lunch, the sheep would be dessert. But Jesus here, in contrast to that metaphor, as the good shepherd comes with the express intent to lay down his life for the sheep. His intention is to care for the sheep by sacrificing himself. And his sacrifice will actually secure the eternal safety of the sheep rather than making them vulnerable. Think about the sacrificial nature of Jesus' life, his heart, his earthly ministry, and his substitute death. We turn again to Octavius Winslow. By the way, I'm going to quote him three times this morning. And I would commend the book, The Sympathy of Christ, to you. In fact, I would commend to you the habit of regularly taking a book about Christ a book of a compilation of meditations about biblical truth of Christ and and compiled into what theologians call a Christology. Rick Holland's Uneclipsing the Sun or J. Oswald Sanders' Incomparable Christ or Octavius Winslow, the one I'm reading from today, The Sympathy of Christ. Reading good books about Jesus as a regular habit of your life is so good. Here's Octavius Winslow talking about the sacrificial nature of Jesus' life and death and ministry. Hungry himself, yet feeding the famishing. Weary, yet inviting and leading others to repose. Himself accused, yet vindicating the condemned. Was there ever such a spectacle of such self-abnegation? Traced Christ in his service. There was no labor too toilsome or self-denying from which he shrank. He would walk 40 miles in one day to take the living water to a poor sinner. He would stoop to unclasp the sandal and wash the feet of his erring disciple. He would stand still at the word of a blind beggar sitting by the wayside and in response to his appeal, pour the light of day upon his sightless eye. He would go when asked to heal a sick servant. He would come when bidden to the house of mourning. He had an ear for every cry of sorrow, an eye for every spectacle of woe, a hand for every object of want, a heart for every appeal to human sympathy. Yea, there was no service so wearisome or so distasteful or so difficult or so self-denying in which he was not at home. This is our savior. This is our shepherd. Denying self sacrificing self for the benefit of others. Jesus' care for his sheep is also marked by investment. Jesus is invested as a shepherd. This comes by way of contrast. Look at verses 12 and 13. Jesus speaks of a hired hand who is not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep. When he sees the wolf coming... He leaves. The word there is he abandons the sheep and he flees. And the word there is the word we get our word fugitive from. And the result, the wolf snatches them up. That is rabidly seizes them. This is a violent snatching away. It's the same word used for rapture in first Thessalonians four. It is a snatching away and the wolf scatters them. He flees, verse 13, this hired hand, because he is a hired hand. And he's not concerned about the sheep. What do we learn about Jesus' care for his sheep here in verses 12 to 13? We learn by contrast that he is personally invested in the welfare of the sheep. Jesus describes the mindset of an employee, a hired worker. What does the hired worker do? He sees the wolf coming. He says, uh, this is just a job. I'm out of here. He abandons the sheep. He runs away. The wolf snatches the sheep and the sheep scatter. Why is the hired hand there? He's there to clock in, clock out, get a paycheck. It's just a job. And at one level, there's nothing wrong with 
Having a just a job mindset, we know that a Christian work ethic is built on working for Jesus rather than for the man. We know that a Christian work ethic is built on worship at the heart level that's invisible to the world that God sees and rewards. But at the same time, not all jobs are the same. Consider the city of Chandler Solid Waste Collection Center. I like that place. I cut tree limbs. I throw out stuff. It's amazing how much trash is produced in life. And it's all got to go somewhere. It doesn't all fit in the can. And so I haul it off to the Chandler Solid Waste Center. And they have one of those giant in-ground trash smashers. Have you ever peered over the edge of that thing? Have you ever heard it smashing all of the limbs and, and shattering bathtubs and all the things that go in there? The guys that work at that facility, they have responsibilities. They need to make sure that all the trash you dump gets bulldozed into the trash smasher. They also work hard to enforce the separation of recyclable materials from that which is designed to be smashed and thrown into the landfill. Cardboard, for instance, and I've learned this the hard way, cannot be dumped into the smasher. Cardboard boxes must carefully be broken down, folded up, and stacked neatly and delivered over to the recycling station. What if a Chandler citizen sneaks some cardboard into the pile of trash unawares? And at the last minute, as as that was being bulldozed into the trash smasher, one of the staff noticed this cardboard teetering on the precipice, about to slide into the gaping jaws of the compactor. What should that guy do? No! Hero movement. I will be there for you, cardboard. And he puts his life on the line, and, and in a last-ditch effort, he flings his own body into the trash smasher to save the cardboard. No, of course he doesn't do that. It's just a job. No cardboard is worth your life. Look, that guy just wants to get home to his family at the end of the day. There's nothing wrong with being a hired hand. There's nothing wrong with being paid to do a job. You're there for the wage. You're not laying down your life for the integrity of municipal waste management. It's understandable that a hired hand does what a hired hand does. Notice verse 13. He flees because he is a hired hand. Does that sound like an unnecessary repetition? The hired hand flees because he's a hired hand. This is such a profound statement. It it reveals the character of the hireling. There's a danger to his self-interest, so he does as he is. His character is revealed in the crisis. The wolf is coming. I don't own these sheep. I don't know these sheep. And I'm out of here. The character of the way he sees his job, his role, is revealed in the crisis. The trial exposes his self-interest, and the wolf is a danger to his self-interest. The crisis reveals the character. The hired hand is obviously working for the pay, not for the nobility of the task, not so that no sheep is left behind. He doesn't have personal interest in the product of his work. He he puts in the time, he clocks out, and he gets paid. This is just the natural difference between a business owner and an employee. A business owner has a unique vested interest in a company, pride in the product, pride in ownership. His name and reputation is at stake in the service of his customers. The owner is invested inescapably in the work very differently than employees. That's natural. And Jesus may mean no more here than a contrast between his role as a shepherd with personal vested interest in sheep and the owner of the sheep to a hireling. Or he might be implicating the Pharisees further. If he has the Pharisees in view here, how is he implicating them by this illustration? The point is that Pharisees, look, you, you got a job for a little while. It's temporary. They're not your sheep, they're God's sheep, but you had a responsibility to lead them with a shepherd's heart as God's under shepherds, and you did not. You're temporarily over a people with a task that you do not understand nor embrace. They don't know what it is to spiritually shepherd God's people. 
They're supposed to be protecting God's people from the wolves. And in the mixing of metaphors of Ezekiel 34 and John 10, they become the wolves. They're fleecing the flock when they should be protecting the flock. They're devouring the flock when they're supposed to be feeding the flock. They're being indicted here by the true shepherd of the sheep. And they will give account for their mishandling of God's precious people. There are implications here, of course, for pastors who are called under shepherds, under the chief shepherd. There are implications here for any self-styled religious leader, any guru, anybody that shows up on the Oprah Winfrey, Info, oh, I can't even say it, shouldn't say it. <laughs> anybody who shows up on the Oprah Winfrey show, giving spiritual advice to the masses, that is dangerous territory. Jesus, by contrast, is invested in the life of his sheep. He's not a hired hand. He's not like a hired hand. Shepherding us is not just his job. The hireling's purpose is a wage. The good shepherd's purpose is the life of the sheep. The hireling's concern is impersonal, a means to an end. The good shepherd's concern is very personal. Christian, his concern is you. He cares for the well-being of his sheep. He ensures their well-being with his very life. You know the difference between a citizen soldier and a mercenary. The mercenary soldier, he gets paid to fight somebody else's war. And he says, it's dangerous work, sure, but I'm good at it and I'm here to get paid. But the citizen soldier, the citizen soldier is willing to die For the sake of his homeland, his family, his friends, his compatriots. He is personally invested in the soil and the culture and the language and the people whose home this land is. The citizen soldier fights differently and is prepared to die out of love for the ones he loves. Jesus, the good shepherd, does not flee at danger precisely because he cares for the sheep. And this comes out in all of Jesus' earthly ministry. We see this in Matthew 9, 36. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them. Literally, his innards churned for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. How many times do we see Jesus in his earthly ministry headed somewhere to be alone to pray? Headed somewhere to instruct his disciples and interrupted with a real sheep need. And the Bible over and over again tells us, and he felt compassion for them. Jesus' care for sheep is not just invested, it is also personal. Look at verse 14. I am the good shepherd, Jesus repeats. And I know my own and my own know me. Jesus is personally invested in the welfare of the sheep precisely because they are his. They are his. He knows them and they know him. Repeating this exclusive declarative statement that just warms the heart of the Christian. Jesus is the good shepherd. Notice his intentionality here in verse 14. He steps in for the ones he knows. Knowledge here is intimate relational knowledge. This is the same basis of the word Ashley was talking about during the communion meditation this morning. God's foreknowledge of his people before time is that commitment to love them before the world began. The same base word for knowledge is here. It is intimate personal relationship. And this is why Jesus lays down his life for them. He knows them. He loves them. Listen, Jesus is intimately familiar with, Christian, with your hurts, your trials, your weaknesses, your circumstances. The truth of Psalm 139 about Yahweh is true of Yahweh in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, our shepherd. There the psalmist writes, O Yahweh, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down. You are intimately acquainted with all of my ways. The psalmist would go on to say, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Listen, there is a way to take the omniscient eye of God and the near heart of God as a comfort. 
And friends, if you don't know the Lord, he still knows everything about you, your thoughts before you think them and every path of your life. Such knowledge is terrifying. If he is not your good shepherd, look at verse 15. Even as the father knows me and I know the father. This is a continuation of verse 14. I know my own and my own know me, even as the father knows me and I know the father. A comparison here is being made to the relational knowing within the Trinity. God the Father knows and loves God the Son. God the Son knows and loves God the Father. Those inner Trinitarian relationships are on display here. There is a uniting in purpose, bound by self-giving love, and that bond is unbreakable. What the Father proposes, the Son executes. I and the Father are one, Jesus would go on to say. And a comparison is being drawn between the relational knowing or love between Christ and his sheep and the relational knowing or love between the father and the son. There are, of course, dissimilarities. We are finite. Our love for Christ is impure and we are totally and absolutely dependent upon him. But what is highlighted here is the similarity an unbreakable bond of love, of relationship between Christ and his sheep that mirrors the unbreakable bond of love and relationship between the Father and the Son. Deep personal knowledge, warmth of affection, and real love. I love the New Testament expression describing a Christian's relationship to Christ. It happens over 21 times in the book of Ephesians. It is the simple phrase, in Christ. To be a Christian is to be in him. Listen, you are no real Christian if Jesus Christ is a matter of historical information for you. Oh, I know about Christ. Well, you don't know Christ. To know Christ, to love Christ is to be in Christ in indissoluble union. Friend, do you know him? Not just know about him, but are you personally related to him? Is he your shepherd? Jesus himself said in John 17, three, this is the definition of eternal life to know God and the one whom he has sent the shepherd, the Lord Jesus to know him is eternal life. Will Jesus say to you at the end of your life, depart from me. I never knew you. Not that Jesus as the omniscient God doesn't know that you exist or doesn't know every detail about your life, every thought, every action, every motive of the heart. Of course, he knows all those things. But for Jesus to say, depart from me, I never knew you, means you were never in his love. Joined to him in unbreakable union by his grace. Jesus' care for his sheep is also substitutionary. Look at the second half of verse 15. Jesus says, I lay down my life for the sheep. This is a mirror of what Jesus said back in verse 11, the beginning of our text. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Notice that that is in the third person. He does this. Jesus has switched to the first person. I do this. Jesus is solidifying here the statement, I am the good shepherd. And he's not just talking about shepherds being sacrificial. He's not just talking about shepherds being willing to die. Not just shepherds willing to put their lives on the line in defense of others. But Jesus' clear intention. I lay down my life for my sheep. This is what Jesus came to do. This is the reason he came to the earth. This is the reason he became a baby at Bethlehem. This is the reason he was born of a woman, lived under law, obeyed perfectly everything God demanded of him. All of his messianic credentials led to this point, his laying down his life for his sheep. When Jesus comes the second time, he will fulfill the messianic credentials of being king over all the earth. In his first coming, he came to die. 
And this little word for, don't miss it in verse 15. I lay down my life for the sheep. If you're a grammarian, that's a preposition. Prepositions are small words that talk about relationships between other words. What's the big deal about a preposition? This is a very important preposition. This is one of a handful of prepositions in the New Testament that describe the doctrine of substitution. Jesus is not simply saying, I came to die for their benefit. For them and in in some loose sense of, of some positive thing that could happen. No, Jesus is saying, I came to die in their place, to stand in their stead. This is substitution. He's not simply willing to risk his life for his sheep. He came to earth intentionally to die in the place of his sheep, to die the death that we deserved. Jesus' sheep were in eternal deadly peril And the good shepherd stepped in our place. There are many misguided notions about the death of Christ. Some believe that Jesus' suffering was simply a demonstration of his love. You know, like Vincent Van Gogh cut off his ear and sent it to the woman of his affections. I want to show you how much I love you. I'm going to suffer. Here's my ear. I don't know if that worked. Jesus' suffering was not just a demonstration of how much he loved people. And Jesus' suffering was also not a martyrdom designed to motivate the devotees of some new cause. How am I going to get all these people to, to, to follow in my wake and take on my name and, and, and create a movement, build something here? Pull a William Wallace. <laughs> and my death is going to free Scotland. Jesus' suffering was not also the accidental consequence of a victim caught in the clutches of the enemies of light. You know, wrong place, wrong time. He was a really good guy. He was a great teacher, a moral man, an example people should follow. But, oh, if only he hadn't been in the garden on that night when the soldiers were there. If only somebody would have stopped Judas. Oh, that guy. Jesus is not an accident of the circumstances surrounding his death. Jesus came to die. His suffering was the sovereign intentional substitution of his own life for ours. And unlike the heroic death of some Middle Eastern shepherd torn apart in the line of duty, whose death leads to the vulnerability of sheep, Jesus' death actually secured the eternal safety of all of his sheep. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us to his own way. Christ came to earth to rescue us by dying for us. And you cannot escape the particularity of Jesus' care in John 10. He says, I lay down my life for the sheep. The sheep here refers to his sheep, the ones whom he knows in verse 14, the ones who will know him. And look down at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. What is Jesus saying in all of this in John 10? The father had sheep for the son to come and purchase with his blood. He came to the earth and laid down his life in their place, actually paid for their sins to rescue them back to God and nobody takes them out of his hands. There's no possibilities here that some of the sheep would not make it. Some might fall through the cracks. Listen, the man born blind in John chapter 9 didn't even know to look for Jesus and couldn't have seen him if he wanted to. And Jesus came and got him out. And then explains what he was doing in John 10. This is particular redemption. The intentionality of this shepherd, he enters the sheepfold of apostate Judaism and rescues his own out. He will go elsewhere to the Gentile nations and get other sheep, not of that fold of apostate Judaism. John 10, 16, I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice. But it is his sheep that he came for. Not for the wolves, not for the bad shepherds, not the thieves and the robbers, not the hirelings. He came and died for his 
sheep. As you read the story, as the narrative of the New Testament unfolds, you find that some of the bad shepherds were his sheep that got rescued. Saul, the Pharisee, became Paul, the apostle. Nicodemus, one of the teachers of Israel, seems to have believed in Christ. So there were his sheep even amongst the, the fold of the apostate leadership. But his sheep are the ones for whom Jesus came and died. Listen to Isaiah 53, 8. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. As for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? Speaking of this Messiah, the writer, the gospel of Matthew, Matthew says a son would be born and you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. Metaphorically speaking, Jesus was the shepherd laying down his life in the place of his sheep. Metaphorically speaking, he was also the lamb of slaughter, the spotless sheep slain as the substitutionary sacrifice. Again, one metaphor can't capture it all. How is he the shepherd and the sheep? How is he also the priest? (laughs) But literally, Jesus was the man. The God-man who walked the earth, who very literally went to a cross. He was falsely accused, tortured. He hung in the air, dangling between heaven and earth as the mediator between holy God and sinful man, absorbing the wrath of his father for all who would be his sheep, actually paying for their sin and purchasing forgiveness with his blood. When you think about the cross, what comes to mind? We wear crosses as jewelry. Sometimes they are architectural embellishments emblazoned on the exteriors of buildings. Crosses can be wall art or tattoos. And we come familiar with crosses, familiar with the symbol, the emblem, and and it's so easy to forget the shame of the emblem. To borrow an illustration from D.A. Carson. Perhaps we should think of an emblem like an Auschwitz gas chamber. A place of torture and execution. Perhaps we could come up with a pendant necklace depicting an electric chair. Some gruesome form of execution. The cross, of course, was the humiliating form of execution designed by the Romans and implemented for the lowest specimens of humanity. To be strung up, naked, bloodied, beaten, posted high in the air for all to see, exposed to the ridicule of passersby and the scorn of the powerful. To die by crucifixion was very obviously to be worthy of no one's respect. A cross was a shame and a scandal. You didn't even talk about crosses in polite conversation in the first century. Why did Jesus do this? Why why would he come to the earth? See, the death of a cross, the death of Messiah on a cross, was not something that sinful men did to him. Death on a cross was what Jesus did for sinful men. Look down the page of John 10 at verse 17. I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my father. Jesus is like no other in his death. No one gets to determine the time of their death. Not even the suicide perpetrator. God's in charge of all of those moments. But Jesus has authority to lay down his life of his own accord and nobody takes it from him. 
And that same authority he exercised in opening up his own tomb and walking out by his own power. The cross is an instrument of the most inglorious shame. And then for us who believe it is the wisdom and the power of God. It becomes the emblem of the gloriousness of God's grace on behalf of those who believe. Listen to Philippians 2. Jesus existed in the form of God. He didn't regard equality with God something to grasp after. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance of man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow on heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue would confess that Jesus the Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God will get glory for himself by forgiving undeserving sinners at the infinite cost of the blood of his Son. And the Son will receive glory because he emptied himself and took on shame and ignominy and pain and the wrath of his Father on a bloody cross. John 10 depicts Jesus as the good shepherd looking forward to his death. Hebrews 13, 20 calls him the great shepherd of the sheep looking back at his resurrection and looking forward to his return. First Peter 5, 4 calls him the chief shepherd. What does this mean for us? When you think about Jesus, you think of him as the good shepherd. Boy, that ought to move in our hearts a desire to come to him. To draw near to him, to lean upon him, to hang on every word that he says. To draw close to him in prayer. To say this negatively, don't go elsewhere for shepherd needs. Don't ignore Christ when his heart is to care for you as the good shepherd. Do you take to Christ your every need? Is that your impulse? Your heartbeat? Where do you turn instead? What emptinesses do you look to for help? The kind of help that your good shepherd is eager, ready to give. What is your gut level reaction to difficulty? It ought to be that basic heartbeat of prayer that says, Lord, help. I need you. One more time from Octavius Winslow. In Christ's strength, then, and aided by his grace, let our response be, Lord, to whom shall I, whom would I go, if I go from you? Who is so lovely, so attractive, so worthy, so precious as you? Who is such a friend, such a brother, such a redeemer, such a portion? Heaven embraces, earth contains no being that can be what you are to my soul. To whom could I repair with my wants? Upon whose arm could I suspend my burdens? Upon whose breast could I breathe my sorrows? Into whose ear could I pour my prayers? At whose feet could I confess my sins and weep my love? But yours, O Lamb of God. To go from you? Death. Rather, let me yield my heart's fondest treasure, costliest, strongest attraction, life's sweetest charm, yea, life itself, Let me give up all of those things before I would part with you, blessed Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus, that is our prayer. To confess you as the good shepherd. There is none like you. No one compares. Oh, God, forgive us for so readily looking to other things whether it be our own strength, whether whether it be the, the aid or the help or the promise that we think others could lend for our deepest soul's needs, our shepherd needs, may we look only to you. We confess that you are good and you do good and you know the wrestling match in our hearts. 
To confess that goes against our natural impulses. We are so easily tempted to think that other things would be good than what you see fit in your good, sovereign, providential shepherding care to give. We're so quick to fret when we don't get what we think we need. Oh Lord, let us trust you. We believe. Help our unbelief. It's in your name we pray. Amen.